I think we can start whenever you want. I think there's a little bit of a delay, but yeah. All right, I'll introduce. Hello, and welcome to the first talk of the 2020 Tyson Summer Seminar Series. My name is Rachel Penchikowski, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Before I do, I want to acknowledge the profound toll of multiple intersecting crises impacting our region, our nation, and our planet at this moment in history. I'm referring to crises of racial injustice and inequity, of an ongoing pandemic, and of climate change. We as a scientific community must not turn away from any of these challenges. Instead, we must turn towards these problems to learn about their root causes, to document their effects, and to work collaboratively and inclusively to develop solutions. Today's talk will highlight effects of climate change on wildflowers and their pollinators in subalpine habitats. Our speaker is Dr. David Inouye, Professor Emeritus from the University of Maryland Department of Biology. Dr. Inouye is joining us from Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Colorado, where he has spent summer field seasons for nearly five decades. His long-term studies of flowering phenology and plant demography are supported by the National Science Foundation and provide critical insights into effects of climate change at high altitudes. In addition, in addition to publishing loads and loads of excellent research articles in top journals, as well as book chapters, Dr. Inouye founded the Ecological Society of America's Ecolog Al Lister, where many of us have discovered job opportunities. And he serves on the board of the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. He is also the lead author on the Pollinator Report produced by the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Dr. Inouye is also a past president of the Ecological Society of America, which many of us are members of. Finally, I want to highlight that he recently wrote a letter to Science Magazine advocating for support of early career, early career field researchers, especially PhD students and postdocs, whose research is being interrupted by the current coronavirus pandemic. And the Tyson undergrad community is also among those um, who has been impacted um, by this pandemic. During Dr. Inouye's seminar, please type your questions into the live stream chat and I will read them aloud at the end. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Inouye for joining us and invite him to begin his talk. All right, uh, thank you, Rachel. I appreciate this invitation. And uh, when, we, when I first uh, got this invitation, I asked whether there was any possibility of setting this up as a, as a uh, virtual visit, just to cut down on the, the carbon footprint of a, of a seminar. And uh, uh, Rachel agreed to help uh, make me the guinea pig for that. And I guess that's turned out to be fortuitous, uh, given that uh, almost all of the interactions that are going on among ecologists now at long range are, are virtual exchanges. So. I'm, I'm happy to be able to uh, give this talk and uh, share with you remotely some of the work that we're doing here at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Here's a quick roadmap to what I wanna talk about on the upper left. Uh, I'm not gonna belabor the point about global climate change, uh, but I will point out that there are a number of regional climate changes that are, or, or cycles that go on, including the North Pacific Oscillation, and that has a, 50 to 75 year cycle. Uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is two to seven years, uh, quasi -biennial, biennial oscillation, which is uh, about two years. And those all interact to create the climate that we have here in the Southern Rocky Mountains. And I'm particularly interested in how that climate generates the winter snowpack and influences, uh, determines the, the spring snowmelt because those turned out to be two really important uh, climate variables for the sorts of studies that I've been carrying on. They impact, for instance, whether or not uh, we have uh, frost damage to flowers. They influence the timing and the phenology and the abundance of wildflowers. Uh, they influence the phenology of migratory species like the hummingbirds I'm watching uh, right outside my window at the moment. Uh, they also uh, influence the phenology of emergence of animals like uh, marmots that have been studied here at the biological lab for uh, about 60 years now, and the arrival of uh, altitudinal migrants like elk and deer. Uh, 
the flowering phenology and abundance interact with those pollinators to influence pollination. That in turn uh, influences plant demography. And so uh, what I've been making a career out of is trying to look at uh, the interactions among some of these different boxes that you'll, uh, you're seeing on your screen. In terms of the global climate, uh, here is an example of the ENSO, the El Nino La Nina cycle, uh, going through its phases in that top graph, the Southern Oscillation Index in the middle, the Pacific North American pattern in the bottom. And so those are the examples of the kinds of things that climatologists study, but that ecologists who work in the Rocky Mountains uh, need to be aware of. The global temperature, of course, is warming, carbon dioxide is going up, and globally, uh, spring snow cover is changing with snow melting earlier. So what we're observing here at the biological lab is, is exactly what people are seeing in most other places around the world where they've been monitoring snowpack and snow cover. One of the changes that's going on here uh, is how much of our annual precipitation we get as snow versus rain. And here's a graph from the NOAA weather station in Gunnison, Colorado, which is a, about an hour drive from, from the Rocky Mount Biological Lab uh, and almost 2000 feet lower. And actually uh, for quite a while now, it looks like that there's been a trend towards more rain and less snow at that altitude. Moving up to a higher weather station in Crested Butte, uh, that ratio looks like it reached a tipping point somewhere in the late 70s into the 1980s. Um, and that change, of course, is going to impact uh, a lot of economic activities. For instance, the ski areas are concerned about what happens if they don't get winter rain and they start to get winter, uh, sorry, if they don't get winter snow and they start to get winter rain instead. Uh, that's going to influence uh, things like ranching out here, which is very dependent upon irrigation from snowmelt. And what happens if there's not so much of a snow water reservoir up in the mountains anymore? It can influence whitewater rafting, um, fishermen. And there, so there are many reasons to be concerned about this change that we're seeing in annual precipitation. Some of the animals that live up here have evolved in a situation where they turn white in the winter uh, for camouflage, including snowshoe hares, ptarmigan, and weasels. And there's some studies now that show that snowshoe hares are suffering greater mortality uh, because they no longer are such a good match between their coat color and the background. And we can uh, make a good guess that the same thing's happening with weasels and with uh, ptarmigan as well. So the context of, of my work is that the environment is changing in temperature, changing in precipitation. Uh, there seems to be increased variation happening in some of these variables. And those changes can happen at a variety of spatial scales, but uh, in any case that they change the ecological environment. And one of the changes that, that ecologists have used a lot in the past few decades to, to look at the consequences of climate change is changes in phenology. Here's an overview, uh, looking out an airplane window on my a flight uh, that I took last year, uh, looking at the area where I work. This is Cre the, the mountain, uh, Crested Butte Mountain, uh, the town of Crested Butte. Uh, sorry, actually this is the ski area town of, of Mount Crested Butte here at the bottom. And then this is the East River Valley. Uh, Gothic is in the uh, shadow on the other side of Gothic Mountain. And so this East River Valley has, has been very, heavily used by ecologists now for many decades. Here's a, a picture of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab taken from partway up Gothic Mountain. This was a, a boom silver mining town in the 1880s. Uh, that uh, boom only lasted a few years and then the town essentially became a ghost town. And in 1928, a local biologist at a college uh, now in Gunnison, Colorado, uh, bought most of that of that town site, a few hundred acres for back taxes and turned it into a field station. So he'd have a place to take his students for summer, uh, summer field work. And this now is probably the most active uh, field station in the, in the country, if not the world, in terms of numbers of publications that come out, uh, numbers of people who work here. During a normal summer, there'll be 180 people in residence here at the field station which includes some staff, but also undergraduates, REU students, uh, uh, 
taking courses, uh, probably about 15 or so graduate students, uh, postdocs, um, and PIs like myself and, and families. One of the things that I think sets this field station apart is how, how family, family friendly it's been and, and the sense of community that people have here. And that's led to people like myself uh, making a commitment to, to spending their whole research careers at, at this field station. We get a lot of snow uh, at this altitude, 9,500 feet or about 2,800, 2,900 meters. On average, about uh, almost 11 meters of snow falls, uh, but uh, a wide range. Uh, and here's a graph of the snowpack, or sorry, snowfall uh, from 1975 up through this past winter. Um, and a picture on the lower right here taken in this winter of 94, 95, uh, when I happened to be spending a sabbatical a year out there and we could ski off the roofs of the buildings if we were so inclined. Uh, on the bar graph, this winter of 76, 77, uh, which was a low point up until a couple of years ago, uh, was the winter that convinced all the Colorado ski areas that they had to put in snowmaking equipment because they weren't able to open at Thanksgiving or in some cases even at, at Christmas time. Those data come from a friend of mine named Billy Barr. He first came out here, I think the summer of 72 or three uh, as a, the equivalent of, a, of an REU student, uh, went back, finished his degree at Rutgers University, moved out here and he's essentially never left. And uh, I think partly to combat uh, boredom in the winter, he started recording every day how much snow fell and how much was left on the ground. Uh, in the spring, he re started recording things like when he saw the first marmot coming out of hibernation, when did he see the first hummingbird, when did he see the first uh, spring beauty or glacier lily. And I found out about 10, 10 15 years ago that he had these long-term records and realized what a, what a real gold mine that was for the ecologists working here at RMBL. And so I've collaborated with him on, on getting some of his data into publication. And a few years ago, uh, he started to attract a lot of media attention, starting with this little movie, uh, I think it's about 15, 20 minutes, called The Snow Guardian, which uh, you can see in that link there. Uh, but now there have been uh, international film crews, everything from CBS Morning News to, uh, to Danish and Chinese and German news uh, crews that have come out to Gothic, sometimes in the winter. The CBS crew came out on snowmobiles in March um, to interview Billy and have him talk about uh, how he got into this and uh, how he keeps these records and uh, a little bit about how important those records are now. Some of Billy's data for total snowfall. Uh, in this case, somewhat arbitrarily, I picked a break point here showing that in the first uh, few decades of his work, of his records, this the trend uh, with a lot of variation was for increasing winter snowfall. And then maybe around uh, sometime in the in the 90s, we changed to having a, a declining snowpack here. Uh, this is the first of many graphs that I could use to point out the value of having long-term records here. And uh, thanks to Billy Barr, we have this data set. Uh, he's also recorded what was the first date of bare ground. Uh, here again, I somewhat arbitrarily uh, broke this data set here. Um, and you can see that uh, it looks like there was a kind of a step change uh, in, the, in the 90s here, uh, but with a, a lot of variation, anywhere from the 19th of June, that one winter I was out here, and now as early as the 23rd of, of April. This year, I think the date was somewhere in that range, the last, uh, maybe around the 20th of April that the snow disappeared. So as you, as ecologists know, uh, most ecological studies are probably field studies, maybe on the order of about three years, maybe four years if it's your dissertation. Um, but what would have happened if we had based uh, our conclusions on what's happening here uh, on as few as eight years, let's say here. Uh, after these eight years, I was really concerned that, that the snowpack here was declining at a hugely uh, uh, quick, fast rate. Um, uh, consequently, uh, I, I was really, really concerned. Uh, subsequently, it looks like uh, this, that trend is not quite as, as drastic as I thought it was after those eight years, but 
here's another plug for why we need long-term data in order to interpret what's what's happening in the field. Yeah, tried to think of ways that we might be able to extend our understanding of what's happening out here even further back. So the blue records here are Billy Barr's observations. And then it occurred to me to look at the stream gauge that the US Geological Survey maintains on the East River down at Almont. Uh, so maybe I forget about maybe about 20 kilometers in a straight line from here and, and halfway to Gunnison. And it turns out they've kept that stream gauge going since the 1930s. And there's a very strong correlation between when does the peak runoff occur at the stream gauge and when the snow melts up at Billy Barr's measurement station. And there's also a very strong correlation between how much snow he measured, uh, the total snowfall for the winter, and what was the peak of runoff and the East River. That, that makes complete sense once you think about it. Uh, but that gives me a, a window back to the 1930s now on how variable has snowpack been and what kinds of trends have there been. And you can see that in that earlier period, there's also uh, quite a bit of variability. Why is the snowpack melting earlier? Part of it's due to warmer temperatures. And here are data for April, the mean minimum April temperatures uh, over the time period that, that we've been working out here. And you can see there's a pretty remarkable warming trend that's happened in April. The other reason the snow is melting earlier is because of, of dust on snow events. Here's a picture of the mountains outside Crested Butte that I took one spring. And you can see there's some fresh snow up at the tops of the mountains, uh, but the lower parts of the mountains, the snow really looks quite dirty. And where does that, where does that come from? It comes from these dust on snow events and they're recorded in the snowpack. And you can see here, there were th at least three uh, dust on snow events that particular winter. And if the snow gets dirty like that, it changes its albedo, uh, the albedo of the snowpack and the snow will end up melting about a, a week or 10 days earlier. That means that that snow is, is uh, no longer uh, being maintained as a nice reservoir for water being slowly released in the uh, throughout the summer, uh, but instead it is causing a bigger peak runoff earlier in the season. Where does that dust come from? Uh, we think it's coming from Arizona. Here's a picture taken uh, outside Phoenix, Arizona of a, a dust storm approaching in July, but the same sorts of dust storms can occur uh, in, the, in the winter and spring as well. Uh, that dust gets blown all the way up into the Southern Rockies as far north, at least as far north as, as Fort Collins, where I, I have uh, friends who told me that they see those dust on snow events up there. And here's a weather forecast, a screen grab I, I got from March in 2012, showing blowing dust as the forecast uh, in March. And that was also the same forecast for all these cities in Colorado, uh, also in Utah and, and uh, in Mexican water, Arizona, I happened to check as well. So, um, so that's now a part of winter weather here that, that, that didn't used to be the case. I, th I think it's maybe partly human disturbance or probably a large part human disturbance, breaking up the cryptobiotic crust on the desert, uh, maybe through a gracing, maybe through ATV activity, but uh, allowing that, that dust erosion. So the, the day of year of peak runoff uh, has changed since the 1930s uh, down at that stream gauge in the East River, uh, showing that we reached a tipping point maybe in the 1980s. So this combination of earlier snow melt shown on the left-hand graph and warmer summers shown on the right-hand graph uh, are generating that earlier snow melt, earlier spring. And one of the one of the consequences of this earlier snow melt, perhaps uh, somewhat surprising, is that we're seeing more frost damage. So here's an example from the 13th of June in 2001, when it got down to 21 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. You can tell that the vegetation had already started to come up before this snowfall. And uh, this is happening with increasing frequency, we think. Uh, it only takes one night, uh, for instance, the 11th of June here in 2004, where it got down to 25, um, to cause frost damage. So I, I, mean, I use 25 Fahrenheit or about uh, minus four Celsius as the cutoff point for what I think is critical for frost sensitive plants. Uh, 
And historically, that last frost of the year happened somewhere around the 10th to the 15th of June. That wasn't such a problem back when the snow didn't melt until the end of May or early June. But now that we have snow melt happening in mid-April, uh, you can imagine that the plants have, are, have then developed frost sensitive buds and uh, are getting frozen. So here's here from uh, a couple summers ago showing that we had, uh, had it got down to zero deg degrees in uh, back in December. That's not a problem then. Uh, during the winter, the temperature stays uh, right around freezing. And then as the snow melts, uh, the temperatures begin to uh, show uh, a lot more variation, uh, but sometimes getting down to freezing again, even uh, after the snow has melted. A close up of uh, 2018, you can see that this, as the snow melts, the temperature starts to, to rise a, a few degrees through the last centimeter or two of snow. Uh, on a data logger that's right on the ground. Uh, but then even after the snow has melted and this, the temperatures start spiking, that we're getting these temperatures down as low as uh, in Fahrenheit minus seven or something like that. And even here into June, we're getting these temperatures that are below 25 degrees Fahrenheit and likely to cause frost damage. Here's an example of one of the wildflowers that is frost sensitive. I've worked on this plant for decades for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it uh, secretes extrafloral nectar, attracts ants, which wander around the buds looking for extrafloral nectar, and in the process, chase off these flies, tephritid flies, uh, which are trying to lay their eggs in the flower buds. If they are successful, then the, the fly eggs hatch and the fly larvae eat the developing seeds. And these plants end up putting almost all their defense budget into attracting ants rather than producing secondary plant compounds, which might deter herbivores. Here's a picture of that extra floral nectar, which is building up on a, a bud that I've kept the ants off of. And it's pretty rich in sugars and also in amino acids and is very attractive to ants. And if it builds up, you'll also find beetles and other insects uh, collecting it. So given that they don't have those protective compounds, the, the flower buds are also very attractive to herbivores, like this porcupine, which is eating a bud uh, and is, is later on going to eat these other buds um, because they taste so good. So porcupines and deer and elk uh, and sheep all love those. Uh, at lower altitudes, uh, this plant, uh, this study site used to be very, very common, as you can see. Uh, it's almost disappeared from this meadow now, I think partly uh, in large part due to the sheep grazing that goes on in this meadow now. In the shadow of, of Gothic Mountain next to the biological lab, we have a meadow, uh, many acres, uh, which looks like this often in late June, early July, uh, just full of these aspen sunflowers. But a picture taken the same time of year, the same meadow sometimes shows no flowers. And that's what happens in a year with frost damage. And I started in 1974 making some annual counts of the numbers of flower heads. And these zeros down here are years where frost got the buds. Uh, they can come back just fine the next year with thousands of, of flowers. But uh, I think these events are becoming more common, more frequent. Uh, here's a graph showing the number of unfrosted flower heads that I counted plotted against when did the snow melt. If the snow melts early, we're likely to have these years like the ones in blue where there was frost damage and it freezes the, the buds as in this upper left picture. Uh, so uh, if you have a late snow melt, then you're likely to get these more normal uh, sunflowers as in the lower right picture. These are long-lived perennials. I've dug up some of the plants. My guess is that they live at least uh, 80 years in some cases, and, and maybe a year or two years, or maybe even 10 years with frost if they don't make seeds, maybe, maybe that's not a big problem for the, the plant's demography. The, but if, if these frosts start coming much more frequently, they're not making seeds, therefore they're not making seedlings. Uh, and because they're long-lived perennials, it'll take a while for this plant to disappear from these meadows, but uh, I think at least raises a red flag at this point if they're not uh, making so many seeds. We do know that in a year with the frost, like in this lower half of the slide, that the potential for population growth is, 
very, very close to just the replacement rate. Whereas in a good year for flowering, they have a much higher value of lambda and are much more likely to, to be a growing population. Uh, so that was a, a, a paper that one of my postdocs put out. Uh, uh, we've actually had a couple papers about this, but the most recent one was last year. The citations down below. This affects not only wildflowers in the mountains that we're studying, but also agriculture in this area. Uh, and also globally, it turns out that farmers see these same events. Here's a farmer's market in Denver where they're apologizing for the high price of peaches because they had a 70% loss of their peaches. Uh, and that happened this year again. So in the area where I live now near Paonia, Colorado, it's a uh, a big fruit growing region and we're going to have no, we had no apricots, we're going to have no cherries, uh, there'll probably be no peaches, uh, uh, we're not sure yet about the nectarines and apples, but uh, worldwide, including grape, uh, grape growing areas are seeing, I think, more frequently these late freezes that uh, we have a false spring, uh, a warm spell early in the spring that triggers flowering, followed by a, a late frost that gets the flower buds and the uh, the young fruits. Let me go back to this graph that I showed a few slides back of these flower counts and take a look at that. Uh, and you probably can notice, maybe you noticed the last time, that there seem to be cycles going on here. And I think that's a real phenomenon, despite the, the zeros. If you eliminate those zeros, it even looks more like a, a cycle. And so here's another plug for why you need decades long studies in order to pick out uh, a phenomenon that's taking place at, at a somewhat greater than a decadal scale. And I think it's climate driven. And this was a paper that was published in 2010 by some climatologists who discovered evidence of a decadal uh, cycle for precipitation in uh, various parts around the world. Uh, so here for Northern California, here's for the central Rocky Mountains. Uh, and the cycles are not the same in all these areas. Uh, in terms of their periodicity, uh, their length. But what I did was to cut out from this central Rocky Mountains graph their, their uh, curve. And I, I might point out that they weren't able to, to figure out what's generating these cycles. They, they looked at a variety of phenomena and well, decided all they could say is here's this phenomenon we haven't figured out yet what's generating it. But let me look what happens when I cut out these few cycles from the end of their graph and superimpose them on, on some of my data. In this case, the day of snow melt. And what I've done here in these black lines is taken eight year running intervals. So the first eight years, the next eight years, the next eight years, and said, what is the slope for those eight years? Uh, and then uh, superimpose this graph from the climatologist paper. So I think we're seeing evidence here of those same cycles. And then those are reflected in turn in flowering by helium thella, by that aspen sunflower. Let me try and broaden this discussion to say, uh, how are pollinators being affected? And I'll start this out uh, shortly with an example for this butterfly. Uh, and but let me talk first about how we get the data for the, the wildflowers and then uh, talk about how that's influencing the pollinators. So we have a long-term phenology project here. Uh, here's a phenological clock. Uh, the, the spring beauties here, the Claytonia are pretty much done for the year. Willows, some of them are still going. We can still find glacial lilies. The uh, Delphinium natalianum is just ramping up. And then we'll move through this cycle. I'll talk later about this gentian, the Frasera at the bottom. And I've talked about the Heliandella sunflower here. And then we work all the way up to the late gentians. And then these are some of the pollinators that we see, including this butterfly that I'll come back to in a minute. So in 1973, there were a handful of us who are graduate students out here working with plants and insects. And on a, on a snowy June day, we got together to talk and decided we'd collaborate on a project where each of us would pick a habitat uh, and set up a, a handful of two by two meter plots and then go around every other day and count all the flowers in those plots, do that for the whole summer. And uh, so we did that for about half a dozen habitats for the first year. Uh, had some great information at the end of the year, decided to keep it going a second year. And after that, uh, most of the group figured they had the information they already needed. And I picked up uh, one other set of plots and, and continued one that I'd been doing. And I've kept that 
subset of plots, uh, some about 30 something plots going ever since then. And we've added a, another 10 or so plots over the years. Um, so we've now counted uh, probably closer to 6 million flowers by going out there three times a week. And uh, for about 120 different species, we have these long-term data now. From one of them, that uh, first plant to bloom after the snow melts, the spring beauty, you can see how closely when they come into bloom is tied to when the snow melts and how a variable can be. So anywhere from the 24th of April, and that was pretty close to what it was this year uh, and as late as the 14th of June. Another plant for which we have data uh, is a bluebell, the tall bluebell. And in this case, what I'm showing is data for how many flowers bloomed each year. And for the first few decades, the number of flowers counted in those plots was actually increasing pretty regularly. And then starting in the late 90s, all of a sudden, uh, we saw a very strong decline and the plants uh, just barely hanging in there now in these plots. Back in the 70s, uh, Graham Pike, who was a graduate student at University of Chicago at the time, uh, was doing altitudinal transects for bumblebees and wildflowers. And this was one of the flowers that he counted down around the town of Crested Butte at 8,800 feet. And he also looked at the, the bluebells, the mertensia that they were visiting. He came back, I think it was 2000, maybe around 2005, six, uh, he came back, went down to Crested Butte and the plants were gone. And I think what we've seen is that the climate's changed enough that the lower end of the altitudinal distribution of this plant has come up in altitude to, uh, to 9,500 feet and above now. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't kept close track of what's been happening at the higher end of the altitudinal distribution, but this may be uh, one example of a wildflower that uh, no longer grows at the lower altitudes because it's, it's gotten too hot. So back to that butterfly, Spiraria mormonia. One of the advantages of working at a field station is that there are people working on a large variety of organisms here, including my colleague, Carol Boggs, who's now at South Carolina. And she told me at one point while we were sharing dinner that um, she had a nine year mark recapture data set for this butterfly species that she hadn't published because it was so variable, uh, she couldn't figure out what was driving the, the biology of this species. And she told me a little bit about its biology. This butterfly is unusual in that the females get almost all their nectar from this one erigeron species that's shown here in the picture. And the females are a little bit also unusual because the number of eggs that they can make is determined strictly by how much nectar they can gather. Whereas many Lepidoptera use larval resources that they gather garnered as um, caterpillars to, to make eggs. So this butterfly is very closely tied to this one wildflower. And I said, oh, well, I, I have data on the abundance of that wildflower and the phenology of that wildflower, let's, let's put our data sets together. It turns out this erigeron is one of the frost sensitive species. So here's a frost killed bud and a graph showing how many flowers did we count plotted against how much snow was there on the left on the 30th of April. If there's a lot of snow left and the snow uh, uh, delays flowering uh, past the time of frost, then we see lots of flowers. If there's not much snow, the plants uh, start blooming early or start developing early and then are likely to get uh, hit by a frost. And the bottom line here is that it, if you look at the population growth rate of the butterflies in year T plus one and plot that against the ratio of flowers per butterflies the year before in year T, that there's a very strong relationship here. We can explain 84% of the variation in the butterfly population's growth rate by variation in flower abundance. And there's also a bit of an effect uh, of frost on, on the caterpillars themselves. But in, whoops, let me go back. It, if the, uh, that ratio of butter, flowers per butterfly is negative here close to the point of origin, then the population growth rate of the butterfly is negative. And if there are lots of flowers per butterfly, as in the upper right-hand corner, then the butterfly population grows pretty strongly. And probably most of you know enough about insects to know that their, their populations are typically 
pretty variable and that in general, we don't know what's generating that variation. So I think this is a really great example to show that link between decreasing snowpack, warmer springs, earlier snow melt, increased frost damage, fewer flowers, meaning less nectar for the butterflies, and then fewer butterflies the next year. Graham Pike, uh, back when he was a graduate student in 1974, uh, also did this altitudinal transect up a trail just up the valley from the biological lab, looking at the bumblebees and flowers. And I did that also in 75. And then we realized at some point, we got to repeat that transect. And we did that in 2007 and found that queens of eight of the bumblebee species had moved up on average 230 meters. We were hoping to repeat that study again this summer, but I think we're not going to be able to get the, the um, REU and students and the RAs that we need to do that. So we maybe next year we'll be able to repeat that and find out uh, is that upward movement continuing. But even over this altitudinal gradient, there's a change in the bumblebee community from mid elevation bumblebee species up to high altitude bumblebee species. And so what happens when those low altitude bumblebee species get up here? Uh, is there just gonna be a lot more competition or will the high altitude bumblebee species get kicked off the mountains and go extinct? Uh, we, we don't know, but um, we may find out. If we look at when do glacier lilies come into bloom, they're about the second species to flower after the snow melts. And when do the broad-tailed hummingbirds arrive? And the broadtails uh, aren't such great pollinators of the of the glacier lilies, but they don't, they rely upon them very uh, much for the nectar because that's the first flower out here to bloom that they can visit. And note that the uh, the relationships here uh, between when we first see them and snowpack are are not identical. And what we're seeing is the plants and the pollinators are not responding in the same way to these similar cues. And therefore, as the climate changes, they're likely to be uh, phenological mismatches between the pollinators uh, and those flowers. There's some evidence of this for bumblebee queens, for instance. The bumblebee queens and the glacier lilies uh, are not on the same phenological track. That's some work from, from James Thompson. If you look at the community level and look at what's the average number of flowers available throughout the whole growing season and use our data to look at early years, 74 to 2002 in blue, and then uh, the later years in, in red, you can see that the growing season is getting longer. That's also this graph up in the upper left-hand corner. The flowering season length is getting longer. And there are two peaks. There's an earlier season peak of flower numbers and a later season peak. And those peaks are getting pulled further apart as the growing season gets longer. And that, that uh, mid-season low point is getting lower. And if those trends continue, uh, we're concerned about what happens in the middle of the season here when hummingbirds need the nectar for their babies and uh, bumblebees need the nectar for their babies. So we're keeping track of, of that community level change. And if we look just at the bumblebees, uh, an analysis done by Jane Ogilvie, uh, uh, our former postdoc, um, and she looked at three different species of bumblebees, a short tongue, medium tongue, and long tongue bees, and then looked how does precipitation and snowmelt date influence both how many flowers there are that they might visit, uh, sorry, how many flowers there are uh, throughout the season, how many floral days of flowers, and what's the total number of flowers available to those bees. And it turns out these relationships are not the same for all three bumblebee species, which means that we can't really generalize and say, here's what's happening to bumblebees. But we have to be a little bit more species specific and say, well, here's what's happening to Bombus bifarius, or here's what's happening to Bombus apositus. Uh, if, if you look at this list of authors, uh, Sean and Zach were graduate students of Becky Irwin, who's a collaborator from uh, North Carolina State, uh, she started 10 years ago, or now, now actually now 12 years ago, I invited her to, to collaborate with me by sampling bees. And so she now does a, 
an uh, every other week sample of the bee species at three or four different altitudes. And so we now have 11 years of data to match the flowering data. Uh, and the uh, other collaborators here, uh, Brian is my son and Nora Underwood is his wife. They're both at Florida State University, but uh, starting about five or six years ago, they uh, accepted an invitation to start collaborating out here at the biological lab. And they, they have their own projects in Florida, but they, they now spend a lot of the summer out here at our MBL and it's great to have them as close collaborators. So the, the community level uh, pattern of flowering, we see this variety of species throughout the summer. And historically the pattern might've looked like this. And one question that comes up is, well, has everything just shifted to an earlier day of year? Uh, is the beginning of flowering the same? Is the peak of flowering the same? Is the end of flowering the same? It turns out the answer is no. What we're seeing is that different species respond in different ways. Some of them lengthen their flowering period. Uh, some of them uh, have changed the timing of their peak relative to beginning and end. So that it makes for uh, different floral communities at different times of the year than we used to see. And that of course is gonna be a factor that influences the pollinators. Uh, one of the things that Jane Ogilvie also did was to look at bumblebees, uh, solitary bees, flies, butterflies, and hummingbirds in terms of their floral, floral, abund floral abundance days. If uh, and these were for three different species of bumblebees, three different species of, uh, sorry, no, I think these are, yeah, these are different species, three of bumblebees, three of other solitary bees, three species of um, flies, uh, surfeit flies, um, lepidoptera and hummingbirds. And if the lines uh, are out, uh, don't overlap with that zero line, then, then there's a significant change going on. So for 11 of the 13 species of pollinators, poor floral abundance days are increasing. And what's relating, uh, what's generating those poor, poor floral abundance days is pretty strongly related to snowmelt. So for snowmelt date, for temperature and precipitation, uh, how do they influence poor floral abundance days? And again, if those lines don't overlap with the zero uh, vertical line there, there's a significant effect. So for most of the uh, snowmelt dates that we've looked at for those 13 species, uh, that seems to be what's influencing floral abundance days. So these metrics for floral resources are changing divergently for different pollinator species, including this broad-tailed hummingbird male visiting uh, the aquilegia, the, the red columbine flower. Okay, okay I'm going to change gears here and stop talking about phenology, and I want to end up talking about a couple of species of plants that I think you'll find interesting, uh, one of which is this monument plant or green gentian, which is a congener of a plant that Peter Bernhardt just sent me some pictures of today, which is having a mast flowering year near you. Uh, here's a picture of a mast flowering year happening uh, near me uh, last, last year. Uh, for instance, here's a meadow that had over 3,000 of these plants uh, flowering. And on, on average, they're probably about 25 to 35 years old here when they flower once and die. Here's a picture of the flower and a, a bumblebee visiting it. I, I've been doing a demographic study of an alpine population of this plant. Uh, so you can see some of the non-flowering rosettes here in the foreground and a dead flower stalk from a previous year. And we follow, have now followed since 1973, several thousand individually tagged plants here. And if you ever wanted a long-term data set, let me know. Uh, here's the data for one individual that was a seedling, a recruit in 1982. Uh, I missed it the next two years when it was really, really small. And then it had two to four leaves. And then in the 33rd year, I couldn't find it. And I think it, that plant died after 30 some years. Whoops. And here's that plant when it was 30 years old next to my finger. So you can see it's still pretty small at 30 years. Another plant that I've followed now for uh, going on, uh, coming up on uh, close to 50 years. And I don't know how long it had already been in two when we first tagged it in 74. And here's that plant when it was 40 plus years old. Uh, 
another one there was a seedling in 1994 and this picture was taken two years ago so let's see it's 20 plus uh, added about 25 years and so this plant shown here next to his tag is older than the research assistant who helped uh, find that plant and, and measure it that year another one so on at, at a minimum they have to reach the 12 leaf stage uh, i've seen one that waited until it was 64 leaves before it flowered on average more of 25 to 30 years. And I think some of these plants like this 64 leaf are probably pushing 80 to 100 years uh, before they flower once and then die. I did plant some from seed in 2000, uh, let's see, I can't see the year here. Um, 1982, I planted these seeds. The first one that flowered was 21 years later. Uh, here's the history of plants that flowered. Uh, majority of them flowered this past year, which was a big flowering year in, when they were 37 years old. Uh, this is the study site right next to where the biological lab was putting in a new building several years ago. And fortunately, I was able to get them to shift the floor plan a little bit to, to save my long-term experiment there. Uh, one of the things I've done here is count the number of flowering stalks in the East River Valley. So I've now counted since 1979 the number of plants I can see from the road as I as I drive up the valley. Last year, as you can see, was a record flowering year. Uh, and then it's somewhere between two to seven years between these mass flowering years. And I know on these years on the left that they were mass flowering years, but I, I didn't count them those years. Here's what it can look like in a mass flowering year uh, near Crested Butte Mountain. And the question comes up, what triggers those mass flowering events? And it took me 30 something years, but I think I now have it figured out. If you look at summer precipitation, uh, not in the year of flowering, not the year before flowering, uh, sorry, this was the year before flowering, not two years before flowering, not three years before flowering, but all of a sudden at four years before flowering, uh, the flowering event, there's this huge jump in the R squared value between precipitation and flowering. And it turns out these plants preform their leaves. So the big leaf here, the big leaf here is a current year's leaf. And if you pull those all off, as I've done here, uh, you can find the preformed leaves down inside. And you find about three to four times as many preformed leaves as current year's leaves. I think these are annual rings here on the roots. Uh, and then occasionally, a, a couple times I've found actually a preformed flower stalk starting in the middle of that. So here's the number of flower stalks I've counted plotted against May to June, May to July ring lagged four years. It'd be interesting to know whether four years ago was a big uh, rainfall year in your area and see if that correlates with the, the flowering that you're seeing this year in Fraser Carolinensis. I've also counted flowering plants in a particular plot and how many plants I thought were big enough to flower but actually didn't. And unfortunately, I don't have every year for these bar graphs in the bottom, but it, uh, after this big flowering event in 19, what was it, about 87, there was a decline in the number of plants that were big enough to flower because some of them had but that number is not going back up very much, which leads to me to be able to worry a little bit that the plants aren't replacing themselves. Uh, but because they're, they're such long lived plants, it's gonna take a few more decades of work to figure out if these plants are disappearing now from this altitude. The last one I'll talk uh, uh, about populations are Vratrum tenuipetalum and people from the biological lab dress up in costumes on the 4th of July for the parade in Crested Butte. And, and I walk on my stilts uh, on the 4th of July. This is also mast flowering. Uh, that's my wife uh, who's five foot one. So they're big plants when they flower. They're clonal. Uh, so this clone is in full bloom. This clone is not yet in full bloom. Here's another small clone that's still on bud behind a big clone in bloom. And these clones uh, we are identifying based on phenology and color. Uh, can get to be quite large. We know that they only clone in years in which they flower and that they only grow a couple of millimeters a year. Uh, 
And so I'm guessing that some of these clones are probably five to 600 years old. Their mast flowering doesn't match the mast flowering of Frasera. And we can go quite a few years between years uh, when we find mast flowering. But uh, Amy Eiler, who's also another former postdoc, came up with a model that seems to predict if you have a cool summer uh, and then you have to wait for preformation, uh, then two years later that you may have a mast flowering year. And she calculated that from 1928 to 1983, about one in every five years, you'd have mast flowering. Whereas since 1984, only about 15% of the years were cool enough to trigger these kinds of mast flowering events as shown in this picture. So if that trend continues, we're not gonna see as many mast flowering years and the plants also won't be able to, to reproduce vegetatively to clone the way they do uh, in a flowering year. Uh, Larkspur, we were out doing demography of that the plant this morning, pollinated by bumblebees and hummingbirds. Uh, their flower numbers are highly variable, but highly dependent on snowpack. If you look at the maximum number, either of flowers, the upper line, or of inflorescences, the lower line, you can see how strongly they're affected by how much snow we had the previous winter. And we, since we didn't have much snow here last winter, uh, we're not finding many flowers to count this year. And that in turn is going to influence the population biology of the flowers and influences the availability of those flowers for the, the uh, bumblebees and the hummingbirds. So the mean number of flowers per inflorescence is declining over time. And these plants abort, almost all of them have some buds aborted at the top of the inflorescence. And the number of aborted buds has been going up over the decades that I've been counting that plant. That percent uh, of aborted buds is related to when the snow melts. So snow melt date may be influencing these plants in a variety of ways. I'll let me skip some of these and conclude here just saying that the climate is changing, snow melt dates are getting earlier, flowering starting earlier, frequency of frost damage is increasing, that's affecting plant demography, that's, uh, we know that's affecting some pollinators like the butterflies, uh, and the variation in species responses may lead to altered and new interactions. And so every year is different in these lines that uh, go between these different boxes that I started out my talk with. So every year we come back and find something's a little bit different. So it's great to have had support, long-term support from uh, the National Science Foundation to keep these long-term uh, observations going. If you need any data, uh, we're happy to share the data that we have for 120 plus species for 46 years from those samples. Uh, we now have 11 years of bee data. Uh, we have a bibliography for those publications. Um, and a data request form, uh, but you can do a quick search and find this RMBL phenology project that uh, my daughter-in-law, uh, Nora Underwood, put together. And I hope that someday maybe you'll have the chance to come out in person and see some of these wonderful uh, wildflower meadows uh, that we have near here and, and uh, hear some more about the stories we're learning about them. Uh, that we have some concern that sagebrush is moving in and replacing some of these uh, wildflowers now as a consequence of global warming. Um, the Social Security Agency estimates that I have about 15 more years to collect data uh, and social security checks. Uh, um, but uh, so I'm hoping to keep some of this data collection going and maybe uh, keep some of it going through a second generation now that uh, uh, my son and his uh, wife are helping with this project. So maybe I'll stop here and try and answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you so much for you know, joining us and um, sharing all of this fantastic research with us and these truly stunning uh, photos, as well as very impressively long lived um, plants. I love the idea of you getting to know these plant individuals throughout your entire career. Come on out so, and I'll introduce you sometime. That would be lovely. Um, so if we were all together in person, you would be hearing thunderous applause right now. Um, <laughs> so we just have to imagine that in this moment. But sure. the questions have been rolling in in the live stream chat. Um, okay. So I'll start asking some of them. Um, 
So one question was uh, regarding um, frosts, uh, late season frosts and uh, plants with earlier phenology. But the question is, on the other hand, is climate change causing later and less predictable freezes? So are the dates of, of freezing also changing? Um, at least here, it seems to be uh, holding steady about the 10th to the 15th of June. Um, in some other parts of the world's, uh, world, uh, the last fr frost dates do seem to be changing and getting, getting earlier. Um, so the frost-free season is, is shifting on both ends, but that doesn't seem to have been happening here. Um, I, I might mention with regard to frost that Carol Augsburger did a nice paper looking at a big frost event that happened in the early 2000s, I think it was, across the Midwest United States and it, uh, undoubtedly happened in your area too. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so another question, oh, sorry, that first question that was from uh, Avril Hunter. Um, this next question is from Elora R, who asks, do you have any ideas as to what may have caused such a strong decline between the 1990s and 2000, and the year 2000 that has been shown many times in the graphs? Well, I think it's I think it's related to climate change. I think uh, we've seen these warming temperatures. I think that's probably what's responsible for, for instance, those bluebells just disappearing from my plot. Uh, we know that they're still common higher up, but we know that they've they disappeared completely from lower down. Um, and I, the only thing I can think of that's changed that much over that time period uh, that could be responsible is is temperature. Of course, we haven't. Unfortunately, we haven't done any long-term experiments to try and manipulate temperature for that particular uh, species. But uh, if you want to do the experiment, I'll get you some seeds. <laughs> All right. OK, so um, Laura R., I hope you've taken note of that answer in particular. Um, one of our new incoming graduate students, Anna Wassel, says, there are lots of species of the same genera here in Missouri. She's thinking of Claytonia specifically. Mm -hmm. um, However, snow is also much more sporadic here in Missouri. And so she wonders, would you expect that time of last snow melt is having as much of an influence on blooming time for the congeneric species here? Yeah, I think if I were working with species in your habitat, I would probably look at something like growing degree days um, rather than snowpack, since, since that's not going to be an influence every year. Um, you know, one of the one of the effects of, of snowpack in your case could be that uh, because snowpack is such a good insulator that it might uh, have a significant influence on growing degree days uh, if you were measuring them at, at ground level. Uh, so it might be interesting to to see whether uh, in years in which you do have a, a late snowpack whether uh, that changes flowering uh, uh, in a direction that's unexpected if you were looking just at snow, at, at, at growing degree days. Great, thank you. Okay, some of the new questions that have rolled in. Um, so there was one question about what species, if any, may benefit from earlier snow melt. Um, and I think you started to get to that perhaps with sagebrush um, invading. Is that an invader that um, can handle early snow melts better than the resident native species? Um, well, those that, that information about sagebrush comes from an experiment that was done by John Hart from UC Berkeley. So for about, I think it was 15 years, maybe 17 years, uh, up until last year, uh, he had a, a, a set of electric heaters running year round over a patch of meadow here at the biological lab. And uh, one of the consequences of that warming and drying of the soil seems to be that sagebrush uh, increased at the cost of some of the herbaceous uh, wildflowers that we had that were in those plots. And so that's, uh, I think, the basis of that statement that the warming temperatures seem to be um, benefiting sagebrush. And so there's some concern that maybe uh, 20 years in the future, instead of having the annual Crested Butte Wildflower Festival, there will be the annual Crested Butte Sagebrush Festival, which might not attract as many tourists as the, as the Wildflower Festival does. Yeah, sure. And Paul Elliott asks a related question um, about invasive, invasive species like sagebrush. So um, he says, considering the observational nature of your research, uh, would you ever consider control measures against 
these invasive species? Uh, we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of invasive species here. Um, these wildflower meadows, like that one that you can see uh, uh, on my screen at the moment, those are, those are all natives. We do have some trouble along roadsides and some of the, uh, some of the citizens at, in Mount Crested Butte uh, have organized to help pull ox, oxide daisy um, and um, tragopogon goat beard uh, that do show up, but again, mostly along roadsides. Uh, we do have a lot of dandelions, but again, those two tend to be mostly in disturbed areas. So one of the fortunate things about working in this habitat is that we don't have a lot of invasives. Uh, one, one that we do have around the biological lab though is um, Linaria vulgaris, butter and eggs. Uh, and we, we have instituted some experiments and some control measures to try and uh, keep that Linaria in hand. Great, thank you. Um, let's do, um, Three more questions, if that's okay, because there's so many here. These will be the last three. So um, Christopher Tamara asks, do you know of any studies looking at species at higher parts of the mountains? And if they are um, keeping their same ranges or, or moving up um, or uh, like the, let's see, moving upward or gone like the queen bees moving up from lower elevations. Uh, take a look at, at the, on the internet for the Gloria project, which started in Austria maybe 15, 20 years ago. So that's a, a world now worldwide project to try and look at mountaintops uh, and set up permanent plots that are surveyed every five years, uh, at least every five years, and to look and, and get some idea, are plants moving up in altitude and how quickly? And there is a Gloria project site here near the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Um, uh, there's also at least one, one or two others in Colorado. Uh, so that, that's gonna help provide some information about what's happening at the higher altitudes. Uh, I'm not doing any work myself of uh, looking at, at that, what's happening at higher altitudes. Great, thanks, we'll look into that. Okay, so the penultimate question is from David Queller who asks, do seed predator does pre, does starting again does seed predator saturation play any role in the masting species you have studied? Um, interesting. So there don't seem to be any specialist seed predators on that green gentian. There is a specialist fly, which I think is undescribed, uh, palopterid fly, that lays its eggs in the in the stalks. So when you go around early in the spring, and if you find a flower stalk, there'll be these female flies that have stuck their ovipositor in the stalk and they die there. So I guess they're squirting their eggs into the stalk and, and dying there. You can still see them wiggling around some before they die. Um, but, uh, and then this winter, when we had thousands of these Fraserous stalks uh, in the still standing up, because we had a low snowpack, they were exposed. And the winter caretakers here told me that they, uh, they actually sent me a video of a, a deer mouse that had climbed up the stalk and was foraging for Fraser seeds on the exposed fruits. And they said there were flocks of rosy finches that were also landing on the stalks and looking for seeds. So I don't think there are any specialist seed predators and gentians in general seem to have a lot of uh, secondary plant compounds. And so I don't know whether the seeds themselves are very well protected, but probably the, probably the fruits are. And the leaves certainly are, we, we almost, almost never find herbivory on Fraser leaves. Fascinating, thank you. Okay, this is gonna be the final question from Nathan um, Chala who asks, have you or anyone tested selective benefits of Prosera's mask flowering? Presumably higher seed set for flowers in those years? Right, um, I have done a little bit of that. Um, and we did find that plants that flowered next to near neighbors uh, had a higher seed set. And so I, I think the probably the, the ultimate factor that's selecting for that mass flowering phenomenon in Fraser is driven by the density dependent seed set, uh, perhaps by um, escaping seed predators. Um, and, uh, and then somehow they've evolved this proximal cue of responding to precipitation as a way of, of synchronizing flowering. All right. Thank you so much. I think we all learned a lot, um, very inspiring long-term research. And I think for those of us who are much earlier in our careers, we can only hope to um, get to know some of our field populations 
um, for this length of time and to do such great research like you and your colleagues have done. Thank you very much. Well, I think it points out the value of, of starting a project early on and keeping it going. It also points out the value of, of field stations and collaborators. And um, it, it doesn't take a lot of equipment or funding in order to go out and count something every year mm -hmm. and, and find out uh, you know, how many Fraser are flowering. But uh, I'd, I'd be happy to answer more questions if people uh, want to get back to me, uh, uh, send me an email message or set up a, a Zoom chat again. Uh, Rachel and I chatted this morning for a while. Yeah. But uh, thanks for the invitation, and I look forward to uh, someday visiting your field station in person. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. We've got lots of thanks rolling in in the, in the chat, so um, know that we're all we're all clapping for you. 